everybody. Thanks for joining me for another One Man Review. Today I'll be taking a look at the brand new Jim Rugg book, True Crime Funnies number one, uh, as well as the zine that he was reprinting, I think, his Rambo 3.5. I'm pretty excited to finally be talking about one of Jim's books on the channel. Jim uh, was one of the early supporters that helped our channel grow by interviewing Sean for Cartoonist Kayfabe. Uh, obviously, the guys at Kayfabe have kind of set the standard for what like comics conversation on YouTube could be. I think they're like the preeminent historians, the comic historians, and uh, they've been doing a lot of great comics work. We didn't talk about Jim's Hulk grand design, I think just because the format of that is not something that Sean and I are interested in, even though I'm really interested in what Jim's doing as a designer, as an artist, the kind of encyclopedic overview of like a superhero just wasn't my thing so kind of a bummer because like I really want to talk about his work I think he's great and he's been very supportive of us and an awesome guy to us so really excited to finally um, have something something of Jim's to talk about that's new I have a lot of his older work but uh, we'll start off with the Rambo 3.5 I do think this is an older work it seems like this must have been made uh, in earlier in the 2000s because it's pretty much about George Bush and 9-11 so you have 9-11 happening, and uh, you know, I've tried to avoid too many spoilers in these reviews, especially since this one is new, but got to talk about the books. So uh, George W. Bush then calls Rambo to uh, <laughs> come in and defeat the Taliban, and that's basically the story of the book. So it's just kind of a goofy fun, and it, it's allowing Jim to try a lot of different things. I think that's one of the things that I like most about Jim's work and especially the cover work he does is he seems very similar to me in that he's uh, interested in being a mockingbird. He can ad adopt a lot of styles and a lot of approaches and obviously um, the guys at Cafe are very interested in production like Sean and I are and so I like seeing uh, Jim have the ability to try things you know he's just trying out a lot of different things including um, collaging in these action figures here like this George Bush and the Stallone and his little tight vest action figures. Uh, so that's really cool. And then just the production stuff of like combining an ink drawing with a pencil drawing that's been half toned with a dot pattern put on top of that. You know, there's just a lot of cool little experiments going on in here. I also really appreciate that um, Jim is kind of poking fun at Roy Lichtenstein. I think these are the Lichtensteins rather than the original. Uh, I'm gonna blank on his name, the, the guy that Lichtenstein was ripping off. Um, and I think these are the Lichtenstein ones though. So I like that Jim is kind of like putting that on blast as well, that he's reappropriating the images and recontextualizing them in the same way that they were appropriated from comic artists and put into museums and, and made um, Lichtenstein a whole heck of a lot more money than, than the artists that he was ripping off. So I feel like Jim's kind of doing that back a little bit and I really like that. And uh, also just had to point out this page where he leans into, you know, it's not like an image book, but he's leaning into the idea of the image gun, the Rob Liefeld cable gun here, uh, and that that would go very well with Rambo and having fun designing that. So I think that's what, you know, one of the things I like most about Jim's work is he's really just willing to lean into those those kind of well i mean the, the whole channel is kind of has that nostalgia to it and he's willing to lean into it and have fun but then push the boundaries with it a little bit as well so that's what this is it's just a fun thing i also like that you have somebody i think probably when jim first made this they didn't have the audience they had but you know that you have somebody who has an audience as large as the kayfabe guys do um, is still like printing out and hand stapling it looks like you know your own little zines like this that there's still come some connection to that uh, underground aesthetic that both of the guys at kayfabe came from and this was part of like what they were doing in their comics career i like that they're still doing that you know they could have their own publishing company by now i'm sure and be doing everything like this um, but they're kind of keeping that underground vibe going. So that's really cool. And then the same thing with this is that this is somebody who's self-publishing. And this is I'm, the other reason I'm really excited about this is I look at, the, like I said, the audience that Kayfabe has and, and see them working with Marvel or Fanographics or other people. And uh, it's just always kind of baffled me giving, you know, what I, I know about being able to pull off with just a Kickstarter. Uh, it's always surprising to me. So I was really happy to see Jim just selling something 
through uh, his site directly to his customers. I know that's not the most popular opinion necessarily, but I do think selling directly to the customer is really the way forward because the rest of the structures in the industry just aren't there to support the artists. And so to have people who have this kind of voice going and doing self-publishing, to have someone like Jim doing a self-published book seems to me as big as what the image guy's doing. And and to me, I just oh, have always wished that the, the kayfabe guys would go totally solo because I think they could make dramatic changes. So this seems like a first step in that direction. Um, obviously, Jim is, a, a, is an amazing designer and like I said, amazing kind of mockingbird in terms of style and different processes. So he's still playing in here. Uh, really like this illustration on the cover with the painted colors underneath and the black laid on top. That's a really, really nice look. Uh, and then just the design of the whole color, a cover, the coloring and the letters and all that's amazing. Um, but really, really like this piece right here. Really enjoy that painted piece quite a bit. Then you get one of Jim's uh, ballpoint pen and notebook drawings that he does, which as someone who also loves ballpoint pen drawing, you know, I just sit here and kind of, ooh, you know, I always love that stuff. So that's a look I enjoy. And then you jump into the first of the three stories with is a diet of danger. And this is uh, based on some memoirs by a fellow named George White. And this is an approach that I think works really well. Uh, just, I don't know, it's like, to me, Kayfabe is very much a, a comics history channel. And a, a, not Jim so much, but a lot of Piscor's work has that historian aspect to it. And I think that works very well for Jim, where he's done some research, um, found this character that he finds interesting, found a university, Stanford University, who has letters and things like that on collection, is using that to do a story. Uh, and it, it's a really nice story and actually seems like there could be a, a sequel to it. I'm not sure, but uh, there's two stories in here that I kind of feel like are projects in the making. One is this story of George White, who's a federal narcotics officer, um, kind of telling his story. And then we'll get to the other one in a second. Um, I Because I know Jim cycles through in the cover parodies and stuff that he does and just in his own work, he cycled through so many different styles. It's a real pleasure to look at each page and not even each page, but each panel. I can really see like, oh, like this line, he picked that line up from this certain artist. Uh, that's a very Dave Matsukelli line right there. And then on another piece, you'll see, oh, that's a super Frank Miller. And then uh, you'll turn the page and it's like, man, that's totally a Charles Burns pattern. Or you'll see some Daniel Klaus or there's like some Chris Ware in here. Um, but such a wide range, you know, people are normally talking about, oh, you see some Matsu Kelly, some Miller and some Klaus, you know, all in one sentence. And to just see Jim kind of flow through that and it all still looks consistent. It doesn't look like he's drawing in a different style in each panel, but it looks like his art. But, you know, it's almost mark by mark. I can tell where these different influences are coming through. And that's really interesting to me. Um, like a lot of the marks on this page here, I feel like there's a lot of different precedents. I, you know, I couldn't even go through all of them. Um, e even, even to someone like Ryan Sook, who's a more contemporary artist, I feel like there's a lot of Ryan Sook in some of these panels. And I'm sure the people that influence Sook as well. So it's just really interesting to look at. And then you do get from like these more old timey production where the, he's blowing out the blacks to make it look like the ink's not as saturated and putting the uh, newspaper behind there and stuff to something like this, which is more fully painted, probably using the blue line process, but looking more like what Jose Villarubia would do with the watercolors. And it looks like some kind of gouache blue, or, well, maybe the blue and the reds on top. I'm not sure. It looks like the blue went on top of some other color. So just really like playing panel by panel, page by page, you know, like here it's more computer color looking. And then by the time you get to here, there's a lot of texture. So just a lot of real variety in there. Really interesting. And like I said, this kind of ends with the suggestion that this was just the kind of opening scene or the intro and uh, it could go from there. So I'm very interested in that. And then this second one I'm even more interested in as kind of like a project, like a, a big project, uh, which is basically the history of professional wrestling as far as I can tell. And this is going back to 1897 and the gold rush and how one character within that scene 
brand would seem kind of like a big um, a big work and made a lot of money on betting and it basically set off and became the you know really helped uh, push forward professional wrestling and the idea of like the work and all of that so that's really interesting to me right out the gate i see this uh, images and the lettering the just the font and everything this looks exactly like what gene day was doing in the masters of kung fu so i think that's a bit of a shout out there um, that that font filled in like that. I'm pretty sure that's where that's coming from. But a lot of really nice drawings. Uh, obviously, again, doing a lot of research of what these towns would have looked like, what the boats would have looked like, what the scenery would have looked like. So you get introduced to this character here, this Frank Kennedy, the champion of the Klondike. And they go through the, the story of his rise to fame and who he is. Um, here you kind of get your Frank Miller, Will Eisner, no panels, just figures running across the page. Uh, really enjoy that. Me and Sean have talked a bunch of times since we both really like, uh, well, I really like MMA and Sean really likes the early, early UFC stuff. We've talked about how fun it would be to do a comic going back and, and tracing like one of the early, like doing a manga with the Dan Severn fight that's like, you know, uh, 30 issues just for one 25 minute fight or something like this. Uh, so, there's this tangential combat sports history here that I find very interesting. Um, and then sequences like this where you really get to see how the bodies interact and tangle up and the shapes they make in the negative spaces and how they flow across the page compositionally. I just think that's all really interesting and uh, well done and points out like, oh yeah, that could make for some really interesting visuals. Uh, here surprisingly this panel to me looks a lot like something eddie campbell would have done in from hell again that kind of historically researched blurry photographs you're using like scratchy pin lines to suggest that you don't have a lot of information but you're still conveying exactly what was in the photo that's really interesting and then these are either just scans uh, it looks like just straight collaged scans but maybe jim has recreated these uh you know by hand i'm not sure but recreations of political, well, not political cartoons, but cartoons about the the match that was being thrown where there was the big work being put in. I think that's, um, you know, a really cool thing, too, when you're doing historical stuff and you can find actual evidence of art from that history. It's a real fun chance to, you know, that's what we were doing in uh, Strange Death of Alex Raymond. It's a real fun chance to go back and purposely recreate someone else's style, um, learn what they did and incorporate it into your own work. And uh, so that's that's really fun to see for me. And then the, you get basically that. And like I said, I think that's a really compelling. Uh, this is like the story of this one one character, Frank Kennedy. But I think you could have basically a whole graphic novel that really goes through the history of uh, professional wrestling. And then this last piece here, which is on the inside back cover and the back cover, is also another just big kind of mm, bit of history from professional wrestling where you have Andy Warhol meeting Dusty Rhodes and writing about it in his journal. So again, a thing where Jim has got some public document and has given visuals to it, which I think is a really, really interesting um, strategy. And I think some of my favorite drawings are in the book are these two right here, where Jim is working more abstract. It looks like maybe he's working with a, a brush, so he's getting these bigger, bolder, kind of brushier shapes. And then just the uh, the abstraction of this right here, the kind of calligraphy of the figures, you know, the not overly rendered, I think those are just two really peak kind of drawing panels right there. So really, really love those. Uh, and then it continues onto the back cover, and here you get what looks like a bunch of Miller, Machucelli kind of mark making here on this one versus a very different kind of the mark making I typically associate with Jim's older work. Uh, and then this right here, which feels a little bit more like uh, derived from a manga to me. And so the, all of those things sitting together, but again, they don't look, it's not like a J.H. Williams, a third page where you're like seeing uh, 50 different artists very obviously on the same page, each limited to their own style. I think part of it is, is that Jim's drawing underneath is consistent, his kind of approach to how he structures the figures is pretty consistent throughout, but he's very willing to kind of take different mark making approaches on top of that structure. So you have a lot of variety, but also kind of something that all of that variety is hanging on that's a little bit more consistent than someone like like myself, who it would look like, you know, 20 different artists uh, or someone like J.H. Williams, where you're like, oh, that's a Moebius, that's a this, that's a this, structurally as well as on the surface. 
Uh, so that's an interesting approach to style as, as well. Um, and I, I'm really curious to see, you know, how Jim continues to play with that kind of stuff. But I'm really, out of this book, I think the thing that excites me the most is this idea of like an ongoing kind of history of uh, the, the wrestling stuff. That's a really compelling project to me. And it seems like when he's doing that stuff, for whatever reason, he's working in black and white, and I'm really enjoying his black and white art. Another thing I really appreciate about how the black and white is presented in here is it's been adjusted so that the whites are really white. You don't have any paper, but other than that, it kind of looks like an artist's edition where you can see as he's filled in the black ink, you can see the strokes of the brush and things like that. It hasn't been all adjusted out to be like solid black, which normally you would want that, I would think. But there's something about seeing how his ink worked that's really nice. Uh, I know they look at artist editions a lot and geek out about that kind of stuff. Uh, I, I, probably even, even more than me and Sean do. So that's cool too. It's like, okay, I have it pretty well adjusted. So it's a nice contrasty black and white thing. But there still is some evidence of the making left in there. And I think that's a nice middle ground approach where you can communicate some helpful tips to new cartoonists who are slobbering over your work, but you're also editing out, you know, some of the mess of the board and the paper and all that kind of thing. So overall, just, you know, this is what exactly what I expected, a really well drawn, diverse book with uh, really fantastic design and really fantastic ideas about material and production all the way throughout. So I hope this is what Jim's doing going forward is just doing self-published stuff. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm wrong about my sense of it, but it seems like those guys have a big enough audience that uh, if you're putting out quality product like this and selling it directly to your customers, A, we're all getting better comics for it. You're not working for someone else. And B, I would assume that has to be more lucrative given the kind of money that Sean and I have made just doing Kickstarter and Sean being the publisher and me speaking with me splitting things 50 50 with Sean I'm still pretty happy with how we're getting paid so if I was doing it all myself maybe paying some people to package stuff I could be making a lot more money so I hope I hope this sold super well for him and that this incentivizes both of the kayfabe guys to go rogue because uh, I really think that they're in the position to to change things really for the positive in the same way the image guys did so I don't look at this as just a cool comic but I look at this as a potential opening salvo if it if it does well enough if the format does well enough if enough people support it um it seems to me like this could be a really important comic that kind of changes the way things work for those of us who kind of want to operate on our own um, and don't want to have to deal with the market unless we want to so i think this could be very important in that way too and i hope so and it's signed on the front both of these are signed so that's awesome uh, but I think I think what we got here hopefully will be a real piece of history. So if you haven't gone and got it yet, get yourself a copy of True Crime Funnies issue number one from, from Jim Rugg. I ordered it directly from his site. We'll put a link down below. Uh, definitely get that. I'm sure probably everyone that watches our channel watches Kayfabe and has already ordered this. But just in case, uh, go out and get this awesome comic. If you enjoy what we're doing here on our channel and want to support us, there's two ways to do that. The first is through our Patreon. We have two different tiers of engagement on the Patreon. At the first tier, you just get early access to the videos that we make. At the second tier, you get exclusive previews of the books that Sean and I are working on, our private graphic novels, as well as the ability to participate in our ongoing webcomic experiment, Prane Day, where you can vote and help determine what happens in the next iteration of the story. Any of the money that we make from that just helps us buy the books that we review, so we put it back into other creators' pockets, back into other publishers' pockets, keep this whole channel rolling. If you want to support Living the Line itself, the best thing to do is support what Sean's doing with Living the Line Publishing. So we'll go ahead and take a, a look at one of the books that you can get from Sean now. The Eisner nominated The Strange Death of Alex Raymond by Dave Sim and myself. This is a gorgeously illustrated and designed book. Dave doing most of the illustration. Um, amazing compositions throughout. What Dave is doing is he's recording his obsession with the death of master cartoonist Alex Raymond behind the, the wheel of Stan Drake's car when they got into a car crash. The best description of the book that I've heard is that it's like understanding comics with pages like this uh, mixed with something like From Hell when you get into uh, the, the theories about you know what actually happened 
with the car crash. And then with Sean on production, it's just one of the most gorgeously printed books you could get a hold of. Like and subscribe and hit the bell, please. So Carson can finish reading his books and let me go home. <laughs>